Hi friends, good morning. So in this segment, I'm planning to just summarize whatever we have discussed so far. So we started off talking about a single degree of freedom, viscous uh, damp system, a single degree of freedom system in which there is a harmonic excitation is acting. Then we went ahead and told that is since there is a harmonic excitation it is always beneficial to use complex exponential notations like this to make the calculations a bit easier then we went ahead and assumed that the response will be also behaving with the frequency of omega where omega is the forcing frequency then we define few no, mm, non dimension sorry dimensionless parameters like frequency ratio which is given by omega by omega n where omega is the forcing frequency and omega n is the natural frequency then we define zeta which is the damping factor c by cc where cz is the critical viscous damping coefficient and this is the damping coefficient present in the system then uh, the final expression what we got for the response of this particular mass x being defined like this is something like this so it is delta static times modulus of g of i omega where g of i omega is a, a complex term it is called the frequency response it holds a lot of importance that we will discuss in a minute then there is a definite phase difference the amount by it is lagging is given here uh, it's completely known as a function of this known parameters then another important thing was in harmonic excitation actually there is a magnification factor or there is a particular quantity by which our static deflection got, gets magnified so that can be found out here so that's that's what we looked at regarding the response then we went ahead and talked about um, the response against different types of excitation so in the first go we assumed the excitation to be assuming a functional form like this then we got the response like this now the advantage of working with complex exponential notation is that now let's see if our excitation is f0 cos omega t which is the real part of this particular term over here then the response against this particular excitation will be the real part of this quantity so real part of this quantity will be this whole thing is real so that comes here then real part of this is cos omega t minus phi on a similar note if the excitation assumes a functional form or a functional representation like this f0 sin omega t which is the image imaginary part of this term then the response can be written as the corresponding response can be written as the imaginary part of this again imaginary part of this will be sin omega t minus phi so that is the advantage of working with complex exponential notation hope you, that makes sense now let's address this question why frequency response is important um, in harmonic analysis the reason for that is very simple see in a harmonic response if you look at how your excitation force is varying with respect to time it is varying harmonically its amplitude never changes its frequency never changes with respect in time as we march along the so the excitation force once we know our amplitude and once we know the frequency then excitation force is not varying with respect to time so the key parameters that define the excitation force is this omega and this amplitude now let's talk about the response once we come to response as well from the basic assumption that the response will be also having a frequency of omega which is equal to the forcing frequency omega one characteristic the frequency of the response gets fixed in a harmonic excitation problem 
now the next parameter which fixes or which ca which tells us about the response is the amplitude if you look at here this will be the response then we talked about this uh, in detail in the previous um, lectures so this will be our if you want to write this capital x will be same as your delta static times g of i omega i'm not taking modulus so this is our x of x of i omega now the key thing is if you plot the response it will be looking like this there is a phase difference given by the this frequency response so that's why it is not starting from zero here it will it is starting from zero since this is sine omega t variation even though it is not so evident in this curve it is starting from zero for the time being let's assume that so here is a phase difference that comes because of this term and here also if you look at this particular figure keenly it has a definite amplitude it has a definite frequency and nothing changes with respect to time now so it would be really useful if we have a plot which tells how this x of i omega is behaving with respect to frequency so when we talk about x of i omega x of i omega has two quantities in it one is the modulus of g of i omega and the other one is phi so one is the magnitude of magnitude of your frequency response which is also known as amplification factor or magnification factor and the other is the phase so these two things are of importance and they are varying with respect to our excitation frequency so that's why in a harmonic response rather than look, giving more important or rather than looking at the time domain plots it will always give a good amount of information if we know how this quantity magnification factor is varying with respect to my excitation frequency how my phase difference is also varying with respect to frequency so these two plots will give us a lot of information now as now as we talked about uh, let's look at how um, my magnification factor or the modulus of g of i omega is varying with respect to frequencies so the x axis is basically omega by omega n and my y axis is the magnification factors and we can see different curves here drawn for individual values of damping factor viscous damping factor so there are some key observations in this slide coming your way so let's talk about one by one so the first one being if you look at this curve very carefully we can see a peaks somewhere here so all these things have a peak here and after a while then there is there are no peaks so the best way to calculate where actually these peaks are occurring we can use the concepts we learned in our pre university simple differential so if we take the derivative of this term with respect to omega and equate it to zero then we will arrive that particular value of omega by omega n where these peaks are coming now i'm not going to do the detailed math here let me give you the um, formula right away so that at omega by omega n equal to root of 1 minus 2 zeta square so this is the value when omega by omega omega by omega and assumes this value then at that location we will get a peak so we are getting a peak throughout that so the one thing to note here is this quantity will be always less than one less than one so that means if we, the maxima will always happen left of this line left of this line this line can be defined as omega by omega n equal to one so the maxima will always happen just beside the just left of this curve just left to this particular curve then that is the one observation now the next observation is that let's after a while there are no peaks this is because if we if in this expression if you plug in anything greater than 
zeta greater than 1 by root 2 then we don't have an we don't have an answer because root of a negative quantity is de not defined negative is not defined okay so this is not defined so whenever zeta value will increase is more than 1 by 2 then we don't have a definite maximum so as we can see so this um, this here we can see a maxima now let's say for zeta equal to 1 which is obviously greater than zeta uh, 1 by root 2 so then as we can see here there is no maxima for this curve there is no particular maxima for this curve okay so it just comes down it just comes down like this the other very important fact is that have a look at this curve this curve is characterizing a case where zeta equal to 0 physically that means there is no damping present in the system so there is a separate way of tackling this particular problem i'm not going into that at this particular condition so this is also known as the resonance condition so this is not resonance so resonance condition is that particular case when you when there is no damping present in the system and it happens at a value when your excitation frequency equal um, is equal to your equal to the natural frequency of the system now with one more thing we will wind this up the last thing i want to tell you is that this is very important now let's say we are looking at this particular curve for which uh, zeta equal to 0.15 okay zeta is 0.15 now let's say i want to know what is that maximum value of my g of i omega max what is this value what is this value here for for this particular curve if i want to know that then i have to plug this formula into the expression for g of i omega here also i'm not doing the detailed math so for a particular value of damping factor the maximum value of g of i g of i omega or the maximum value of the magnification factor will be 1 divided by 2 zeta root of 1 minus zeta square make sense so these are a few takeaways from the uh, from the frequency response of for magnification factor this is the frequency response for magnification factor so first one was this then second one is this sorry first one is this one and the second one was zeta greater than 1 by root 2 then you don't have any peaks then the maximum value of your magnification factor for a given value of damping factor is this okay